Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we'll be taking a look at some of the measures that fish processing and feed seafood can use seed chill has been implementing to improve its waste management and energy use. My name is Stephen Kent and I look after the cities and built environment portfolio here at Two Degrees. I'm talking to our presenter today, Mike End of Seed Chill, who has built a wealth of experience in tackling waste and energy issues. His talk will last for around 20 minutes, which will lead us for 10 minutes for questions at the end. To begin, I'd just like to remind everyone that you can submit questions for the webinar using the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Just type in your question and press send, and then wait till the end before answering as many as we can. As an aside, if you should have any technical issues during the presentation, please use the chat box on the right-hand side of the screen to send me a message, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So without further delay, I'd like to hand over to Mike, who will get us started with today's presentation. Over to you, Mike. Hi, Stephen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Evans. I'm the Group Health and Safety Executive for the Icelandic Group, which really consists of two major divisions. There's a third one, which there's cold water, uh, which is breaded and coated, and then uh, the sea chilled division, which does predominantly the chilled seafood. As part of my group health and safety role, I also ended up covering our environmental issues for the sea chill division, including their own brand, the uh, Saucy Fish Company. Just a background, as always, on the companies. Seachill itself was founded in 1998 and then subsequently acquired by Icelandic Group in uh, 2004. In addition to a very small traditional fish curing facility, Russell's, which is actually down on the dock still, uh, Seachill operates from a 7,600 square metre production facility here in Grimsby with around 550 employees working over two shifts, that's two eight-hour shifts, and roughly production is around about uh, 450 metric tons per week of chilled fish. We um, include salmon and many other white fish species, which we supply predominantly as unlabeled products to the UK's major retail and food service businesses. Plus, of course, our own brand, uh, the Saucy Fish Company, which I'm hoping that some of you have seen and been seeing the advertisements on uh, TV. And just very quickly for you, there you can see a range of our products on the uh, screen now. See, is act actively engaged in actually the issue of sustainable fishing itself right from the start back in 1998. It's true to say that other environmental issues weren't as a priority, to be honest. Being in the building industry for Sea Chill, we receive our orders in the morning and that evening stroke, and the following morning they've got to be out. Or the uh, big multiple U retailers put a bit of a punitive uh, financial penalty on us. Our main driver in looking at other it has been the push from our customers, which especially Tesco, which is speaking to you today as one of Tesco's major category suppliers, when we ended up being invited to join the Two Degrees Tesco Knowledge Hub within Two Degrees, that time at I think two, possibly three years ago. So as a result of that, the business was uh, challenged to look at the whole spectrum of environmental issues and decide on the action plan for each of the uh, four action areas you can see on the screen now, namely the waste, energy, water, and carbon footprint. Waste, has to be said, was very low on the agenda, even though we produce around about 107 tons of product and waste per week. That's 20, about 2011, our attitude to waste was that it was clogging up the external yard area which hampered vehicle movements and it was really unsightly. And to be honest, at that time, we simply did someone to take it away in order to keep the yard tidy as well as avoiding potential food contamination issues. 
They resulted in around 50% of our waste going to landfill. Not exactly a very good record. However, in April 2011, a few things changed. The thing that changed was that our then waste carrier actually went out of business. And a new waste carrier emerged. And this, in fact, was formed by a former employee of the waste carrier. And he was actually well aware that there were recyclable materials going to landfill. Secondly, we've had an emergence of our yard manager, stroke senior driver, who he emerged as a green champion, being passionate about recycling. And he was him who started to challenge our new waste carrier to actively see new markets for the waste that was going to landfill. This decision and let the Green Champion have free and put forward justified cost of proposals for recycling our various waste streams. And they, although we did try to uh, have sanction on lines as a premium in our production areas, plus it's very hard to instill a uh, company-wide culture when we've got constantly changing labour agency in and out of the factory. So we were, in fact, it's quite impractical to have a number of different bags for segregating waste on the, each line. Instead, we just gathered the waste together and segregated it in the yard. Now, I say segregated in the yard, it literally wasn't the yard. We had a uh, big metal table in the yard open to the elements. However, by the end of uh, 2011, we'd built a dedicated area for uh, segregating and bailing the waste. We did have established uh, recycling pathways, and they were the standard polystyrene the lidded boxes, which is what the uh, salmon is delivered in. Uh, we produce about 13 tonnes per week of these boxes and lids. And they go off and they're recycled into a variety of the plastic wood products such as picture frames, skirting boards and decking. Although we were already recycling that, we were actually doing our own crushing. But uh, now they're just taken away on, on the back of a lorry and they waste carry themselves as all the various uh, crushing of, of those boxes. As well, we had the fish waste being taken away, all the fish trimmings by the uh, fish meal company, which was set up by, in fact, Grimsby Fish Merchants way back in 1935, where they saw a lucrative uh, market for their fish trimmings and to get some revenue. So the fish meal there is generally used in pig and poultry feeds, plus, of course, some fish, fish oil. We were all recycling cardboard packaging along with cardboard reels from our label wheels, and that's done and recycled through the well-established processes of the pulping, the filtering, and the inking, and the fishing. We have some often small farm fish fillets delivered in uh, Corex uh, boxes, that's corrugated PP boxes, and these are manufactured from virgin PP, and they're washed, dried, shredded and included to be added back to produce the non-virgin polypropylene. However, with the addition uh, of the new uh, waste carrier, once he came on board, we then started recycling some of the other waste that we had previously thrown away. So one of our, some of our new uh, recycling pathways included 280 kilos per week of the PET and the PE scrapping. It's quite, quite amazing to think that's how much. So all the boxes that come in, the uh, EPS boxes of salmon, they're all strapped up there. And it's quite a lot of strapping there, 280 kilos a week. Again, this is recycled into a range of polyester products such as clothing, your fleeces, your bed sheets, as well as being reused uh, to make more strapping. We have 300 kilos a week of cotton liners. As a chilled factory, the main production areas are running around uh, 10 to 12 degrees. So 
nice function of these is for the employees, they just wear them under the uh, food handling gloves to keep their hands warm. Really. But three of the kilos a week of these were being produced, obviously going into uh, landfill. But now again, they are recycled and it ends up shredded and incorporated into the material which is used for uh, large dumpy builders' bags. Interesting one for new recycling pathways for our wellies and rubber wellies. Don't use as much as this, we're trying to uh, limit it, but with agencies passing through, at the moment we don't uh, re sanitize, we tend to go uh, out the wellies at, at the moment. We get about four tons a year of wellies. And rubber oilies, and then shredded into two inch strips, and then subsequently used to manufacture some rubber netting substrate, which is then used for coral reef restoration, as the uh, basis for that, for the old polyps to link onto. The thing that we're now recycling is the uh, polythene liner bags. Some of products will come in. Um, Inside the liner, the liners of the bags are then folded over and they're iced, and this is to prevent the ice um, bleeding the flesh. At the moment, a growing demand for recyclable uh, polythene, so we use that's getting recycled. The one thing with that is it does have a fishy taint, so that downgrades it slightly. So there are some polyethylene uh, polythene line recycle plants in UK but who don't take it, but most of ours is shipped abroad uh, to be recycled. There are two products we are struggling to recycle at the moment, and that, those are our hair nets and the old food handling gloves. This is because of the main component material, but the uh, thin elasticated band on the glove gloves and also then on the obviously rim of the hair net. So that's being a challenge at the moment. Um, we're not, we've had a request on two degrees, if anyone's got any ideas, short of having someone cutting the little cuff off, which I don't think is going to be happening. But this now, with the uh, new recycling pathways, plus those, the established pathways that we have, means that we are now consistently uh, recycling. 90% of our waste. And this is an overall monthly summary for the for the last last year, 2012. A month by month basis is cumulative graph. That is the graph that goes out to uh, the managing director and the board, and also we post a copy up on our employee notice board. So uh, kept informed of what's going on, and uh, like looking at our little green smiley faces. Here we are oh, in 2011, you know, quite a few red crosses there. So, the other advantage, especially the thing that gets the managing director excited, is with the new uh, recycling pathways, is we have some increased revenue from our waste and overall, waste costs have been reduced by 30%. And this really has involved minimal, minimal investment. In the main factor has been just a change of attitude, a total change of attitude. The in the segregation area, it's had an actual cost of, but the actual project itself was around about 30k because we had to knock down a forklift uh, truck charging area, relocate that to throw it up, but for 30k, and so the pay, payback on that is around about the four. Four or five years ROI on that. That's, that's on the waste, but we've had great benefits there. We're also, as a chill business, um, which is using refrigeration, we're also very high energy consumers. And we recently introduced a number of electrical energy saving measures, including the use of voltage optimization. Just being installed, but we have, we're hoping or projected to save 40k a year at the uh, 
we're going to the bottom end, we've been promised 10 to 12 percent saving when we're going budgeting on 8 percent, but even on 8 percent there's an 18 month uh, or over on that particular voltage optimization. We use the variable speed air compressor which has saved us 8k a year in energy and we've also introduced a new improved and more efficient fillet trimming machine which on energy costs alone they is saving us uh, 1k a year. We've just finished uh, completing a new amenities block where for the first time we put in some LED lighting as well as motion sensors because we realised that in our in in the loose blocks over the weekend we previously just left the lights on 24 hours. So uh, we rec we've calculated savings on that uh, using the LED lighting and PR motion sensors about around 4k a year. To have some other measures as well. We've We've got our own uh, store. New to us previously, we were sending out to coal stores. And again, in there, we put um, MD in, in that as well as using inverter motor control and the electronic expansion valves for a more efficient operation of the uh, actual refrigeration system itself. We're looking to save a further 2k a year by retrofitting the LED lighting into our old amenities block. So we bought a load of additional units on the of the new amenities block. I'm going to bleed those in over 2013. Teachers a wet fish factory, and we use a lot of water around about 400 tons a day. Phenomenal amount. That's through processing, of course. Every evening we've got the uh, night hygiene, washing down, filling up, rinsing. Um, started on the uh, looking at water as well. I mentioned earlier that under energy, this improved efficiency fillet trimming machine will actually this also saves water because water is being used in for the around the key process and we are actually saving in terms of water costs 5k a year through uh, reduced water usage because it's Philip Mini actually bought for saving either energy or water it was just on the improved efficiency of trimming and that alone um, has an ROI of eight, 18 months as a Adding, they also sold it to us with a, by the way, we also save you water and save you energy. So that almost, I would say, was almost free. Free charge for that. Our challenge, to be honest, is to install some sub-metering to identify hot spots, which in turn will focus our efforts on further reducing our water usage. And uh, that program when the MD stops building other bits and pieces. And just quickly to say that uh, we've got to have the process of collating data for analysis and calculating our product's carbon footprint. And on that, um, the, we've started, to be honest, acting at scope one at the moment. So from the coming into the factory and going out at the other end, Want all the little bits and pieces together on the, in this jigsaw puzzle of trying to save energy. We're looking at saving the business certainly by the end of this year, about 7k a year based on a 2008 baseline. Also, it has to be said, we're not standing still because our IT department is currently looking at virtualizing our servers so that we can run our IT operations on 84% as actual physical service. I'm highly reliably informed by our IT manager this isn't the cloud. It's just physically and boosting the uh, capacity or somehow the servers. And he said it, we would be the equivalent of 12 servers on just two physical
critical servers. So we will be looking to uh, save energy in terms, not just in terms of the servers themselves, but also reduce energy requirements for uh, air conditioning for cooling the uh, server room. One other caution, though, I would say, or in spite, in spite of all our efforts, is that as our suppliers of own brand label products or own label products to the multiple retailers, we are not in complete control of our own destiny. And an example of this is what, about 2008, the customer changing their pack pack packaging format. So basically, they changed from the flow wrap to that pack, which meant we had to change the packaging machines, and these machines were definitely uh, definitely more hungry in terms of energy. Also, currently, uh, talks underway uh, involving changes in the design or the shape of the packing, which potentially will increase the amount of packaging per pack. There's a conflict between them telling us that their market research has shown what the consumers like and how pretty the packs are, and saying, yes, but you're also telling us to reduce our carbon footprint. So that's an ongoing discussion at the moment. And that is just a little summary of how what we've been doing. So this has actually been um, cost-free, just a change in attitude. We have the improved uh, trimming machine where as a byproduct, you can also say that we got the improved uh, efficiency, energy, less energy used, and um, the less water used. Okay, that's about wraps it up, folks. So, any any questions? I'll do my best to answer any. Well, thanks a lot for that, Mike. Really interesting to uh, to hear what you've been doing. But we'll we'll go straight into the. Um, Q and session now, and we've got quite a few questions come in. Yeah. Um, I think the sort of general one to, to start off with is um, your target for waste recycling. Um, you've achieved on ninety percent. I think it's possible to achieve higher, and um, if so, what would it involve more investment to achieve that? And do do you think the return on investment isn't worth your while? Um, good question. I mean, obviously, if we could find out what we could do with our gloves and the hair, that would be fine. And that's one thing that we've actually just challenged our waste carrier to do. And he's been very proactive in this. He's out and out and talking uh, to, to people. Uh, something I didn't mention. One of the things we recycle, we're also recycling the uh, backing paper from the labels. And one of the issues there, unfortunately, is that it's a bit waxy, so it's not really good as uh, awfully good as a bedding material. But he is using it. it, says he's found someone who's interested. So we started to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, we've also explored yes. to energy, but at the moment, the to do that, really the benefits would be outweighed by if you wanted to be go into the nth degree by the time we've trucked it all the way to our nearest uh, processing plant for that, then you know, there wouldn't be actually any benefit. So that's why at the moment we're not doing any waste to energy. We can't do anything on site, we've got a very small fear budding at the seams of the only way we can get us up to be honest. But yes. I think it was possible, never never say never, and we're trying to do as much as we can. We may be even looking at uh, doing a wormery for tea bags, uh, just trying to count the number of tea bags we get through a week. I was surprised how many tea bags we got through, because we then use then the product from that maybe to give a bit of free fertiliser to our employees, and that's certainly good PR. Sure. And um, there are a couple of questions on reuse, and one is... Um on the EPS boxes, could we use those or or are they classed as contaminated waste? And the only is around the Wellingtons. Someone someone's asking, do, do you recycle Wellingtons once they've when they're worn through or, or 
what, what the process with that, and could they not be sent off for, for reuse by other people? Well, that, well, the Wellingtons, that's the one I just, just the bit I remembered. The Wellingtons, um, yes, we do when they go, and the soul goes, the people do a lot of walking on the uh, flat concrete floors, and so we've got some improved Wellingtons, and very durable. Yeah, sure. When when the soil wears out, they start letting in a bit of water. Then they're sent to We are exploring actually the way as wellies per se, and people are thinking as China who might be interested in taking a batch. They've taken a trial batch to just have them as Wellingtons, and they'll do the sanitising of the wellies. But we do have a large number of. Um, Agency does fluctuate in our busy times of Christmas and Easter. So, those people, we don't, it's not an ongoing thing that we do with sanitising wellies. It um, has been moved to, but at the moment we haven't found it to be cost effective, and really we, we have some people here as a group for two to four weeks, and often some of their wellies get uh, thrown away. But we are looking at Seeing if there's anyone out there who can be cost effective and um, to sanitise our wellies, we can sometimes we can have 50 extra staff. Sometimes we can have a 150 extra agency. So they're not consistent volumes. What was the other part of that? And, and, question? and the, the other question was, um, could the um, EPS boxes be reused? Um, they're classed as con they are as contaminated. Um, by the well, by customers that we, we are driven by their technical manuals, whether it be Tesco, Sainsbury's, Morrison's, and so they don't prove they're not easily. And it's the tran again, it's the transporting them back. We have no, we have no use for them. We have explored looking at big, rigid plastic containers. And some of the Scottish salmon suppliers were doing those and looking then at uh, power washing and disinfecting. But that went that went away. That went away. And there was this issue of storing in the storing them in the yard. There's quite a large volume of those, and we we didn't have the space also to store them. And lots of then arguments between ourselves and the, the suppliers as to they they were being returned clean enough, and it was worked out too much of a hassle to be to be quite honest. <laughs> but Jay, yes, the boxes are contaminated, and in fact, in the recycling, they do they are second grade EPS. They are tainted a little bit, so uh, not that many people who rush after them. And we do we do recycle them, but it's it allegedly has a bit of the fishy taint even in the polystyrene itself once it's recycled, allegedly. Sure. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, to, one more question there on waste. And it's asking, did you, how many people do you have employed doing the segregation process? Or have you managed to build this into your, to your normal day-to-day -day processes so you don't have separate people doing the segregation of the waste? Um, they're combined with the with the uh, yard jobs. So um, being a food factory with increasing um, requirements from the sort of hygiene requirements, we take our waste, whatever it might be, out as far as the yard. And we have these there are people employed to move all the various rubbish around the yards, the waste around the yards. Um, yes, they were already out there cleaning and keeping everything tidy, and we've been a bit more of a high-profile role, I suppose. But we've also we haven't been heating for them, but we put them under cover. Yeah. But on, on the both shifts, it's just two people per shift. Great. So they were already we were already moving waste around the yard anyway, but now we're moving it and then also segregating it and removing it around, so no additional people. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, moving to energy, did you or did you install energy submetering in order to 
um, prioritise what you were going to do. And, and the sort of subsequent question to that is, how did you prioritise what, you, what measures you're carrying out? Uh, well, there was some done by local the local uh, university on submetering on various compressors. And they have used, we have installed variable, variable speed compressors, so there were some studies done on that. Uh, but as far as federal energy, voltage optimization was one of the things that was being touted as a general overall saving. Uh, and I, I mean, for us, it is in a shield environment, we are we are an we are an open quite a large open effectively open plan area, and so it's the it's the whole kit and caboodle, which is why certainly on the voltage optimization, we look seriously considered that, and I, I think our engineering director will be quite upfront and honest and would and say five years ago with energy costs he wouldn't have been interested in uh, ten cent savings. But now energy prices, and uh, it, it seemed sensible to do. So the whole factory as, as, as a whole, really, look, looking at that. Uh, we haven't had any campaigns per se about switching off lights. We we, we do, um, but we're looking at some of the big big wins, the big wins. And so we've, we've got hopes for the voltage optimization, and we've got a. a there is a performance agreement written into uh, the supply of the machine. Another just had come in is someone's asking how intrusive is it having voltage optimization carried out? Does it involve much sort of work on site? Um, no. Basically, the uh, company involved came. They did this. They they did some monitoring themselves. They, uh, they gave, gave a report and said they would guarantee minimal 10 to 12 percent. So we've estimated our ROI on even 8 percent to get our eight, uh, 18 month ROI. Sorry, sorry on the question. Sorry, the computer just went there. Well, just wondered how intrusive it was in terms of, of the. Were, were people needed to come in on site, and did you have to shut down any processes oh, to carry it out? Not shut down. Well, do it when production isn't running. Uh, certainly, so we that is for our business as a whole. Done on major things. The one thing we obviously were concerned about is um, if it didn't work. But we have had various site visits around the country. Um, where people have said there, were, there weren't any issues, but sure, there will be a bit of a shutdown on the uh, over a weekend, and the actual link to it was about it's, it's not a day, it's not a day, and so we're confident of tenders being held in all our freezers, etc. So overall, it's not it wasn't that, and the actual fitting of the unit is quite a surprisingly small small unit. Uh, and the company involved were very, very professional. And so yes, we worked worked well together there. Great. Thanks, Mike. Just time for, for one last question. Um, someone's asking, do, do you use LEDs in the chilled environment? And if so, does the chilled environment affect their performance? So I think they're talking about the, the, the lux levels that they can achieve. Right. Um, well, with the chilled area, and the was is we've now built our own little cold store. And in the cold store, uh, it was recommended we put LED lighting because of their um, improved, obviously, efficiency. That's been in, actually, has been in about 18 months, and we haven't noticed any deterioration or any... Um, Advert comments regarding lighting levels. Um, Immunity certainly, again, it's only just happened, but that is certainly. It's looked much smarter. Lots, lots of employees have commented that they like the new lights. But I've had them in long enough, I would 
say to say that we've had any deterioration of um, the actual light quality. But they, the LED bulbs is it around anywhere between 20 to 25 years. So ho hopefully not. Hopefully not see them. Great. Okay. Well, that, that's all we've got time for um, for now. But I'd like to thank Mike for his time today and uh, for getting through so many questions. And um, also for everyone who joined us on this webinar. Just to review, a recording of the webinar and the presentation slides will be archived on the Two Degrees platform. So on today, be interesting and useful, and that you'll be able to join us for further webinars throughout January. So thank you.